God is good. Amen. And Brother James, I know I'll keep you busy. Actually, uh, let's let's give somebody else a job here. Brother uh, Ronnie, why don't you come receive the offering? And God bless you as you give. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts. Time to run. 
the church said amen. God bless you. May be seated. God is so good. Praise the Lord. We're just so happy each one is in the house of the Lord today. And I know that God is ministering already. It's not that he's going to. He has. Amen. Because we sing the word in song and then we hear the word preached and we uh, and, uh, just go filled. Amen. We go filled. We leave this place filled with the goodness of the Lord. Amen. We're going to dismiss our children. Looks like they're already on their way. <laughs> Some of them are gliding on their way out, and the parents are rejoicing. And <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't you just love Sunday school parents? You get to just sit and enjoy for a little while, and then we're going to turn them right back to you. <laughs> Well, I do believe that summer has arrived. My goodness, I, I'm so sweet. I almost melted yesterday. It can't be. My goodness. Amen. And you know, we were looking at the forecast for camp and it was, we were looking at 10 days of rain. And so we prayed and now we're grumbling that God answered our prayer. <laughs> Not really. Not really, it's great. And uh, we're just so grateful. Uh, that God has blessed us with a beautiful couple of months. April, May, and June has been so gorgeous and wonderful. And let's just soak it all up and enjoy the beauty that is around about us that our heavenly lover has given to us today. He gives us flowers every day. Did you know that? Well, you say, I haven't got any flowers in the last little while. You just look outside that door and you'll see all kinds of flowers, not just the ones that Sister Juanita planted out here that look so beautiful. Don't they look great? Uh, but you look over there and you'll see some that God planted. And they're also beautiful and that's his way of saying that he loves us. Amen. Now people may take it for granted, but I certainly don't. Amen. I know there's a God that loves me and he's made some beautiful people, hasn't he? He's made some beautiful people. And they're in our lives and I think the most beautiful people in the world are in the family of God. Amen. And God's people. I love God's people. And I'm so grateful today to be with the family of God because I'm strengthened here. Amen. I came in here exhausted and some of you as well from your week. But God came in here and is strengthened in his power. Amen. And in his gentle way, he's so strong and so powerful, yet he's so gentle. He just doesn't push his way. He just gently knocks on our heart's door. And how can you say no to that? Goodness. How can you say no to a God that is in this place that is so lovely, so wonderful, so beautiful, so amazing? How could, how could a person say no to that? Amen. I just fall before him. Amen. Every time he passes by, by his spirit, I just fall to a million pieces when I feel the presence of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Like the country song says, you walk by and I fall to pieces. <laughs> Amen. So I feel in the presence of the Lord. I've always had a tender spot in my heart for God's presence. Uh, since I was a very young child. And then I felt God, I knew God was real. The first time I set foot Pentecostal church and I felt, I just felt there was just that awareness, a conviction that this is real. This is true. And if your heart's open before God, like that of a child, you'll know. You, you won't have any question. You will know and you'll just say, yes, God, have your way in my life. And, I, you know, <clears throat> it's not always easy following the Lord. I won't say that it's always been easy, but it's worth it. Amen. It is worth it. Amen. Hallelujah. And you want to go through life in a spiritual jalopy? You can. Amen. But I'm riding in the best wheels. Hallelujah. I had to pay pay a bit of a price for what I'm writing, but amen, it's worth it, amen? amen. You get what you pay for, amen. praise the Lord. <clears throat> Not suggesting for a moment that we pay for salvation because Jesus paid for that right. with his life. But he said, if you're gonna follow me, <clears throat> excuse me, he said, if you're gonna follow me, you gotta take up your cross. Right. You're gonna take up your cross 
And that means there's a price to pay. And he told them right from the onset, he said, the road is wide that leads to hell. And you, you'll have lots of company. But he said, the road is narrow that leads to life. And there'll be times when you'll walk alone. But you'll never, ever really be alone totally because Jesus will be with you. Amen. He'll hold your hand. Amen. If you've never had your hand held until Jesus holds your hand. Nothing like the hand of God holding your hand and just taking you through whatever you have to, to go through. You know, and you'll go through a lot of the same stuff that people that don't know Christ will go through. They'll go through all the same things, but you'll go through them with the wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And you'll go through it in first class. Amen. Amen. You'll never go through it alone because he'll walk with you. Now, <clears throat> the Lord has been talking to my heart in the last little while. And I've felt different things. I've, I've got some notes, but I'm not going to go with those notes today. I'm going to turn you in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. And we're going to look at the first verse. And my message today <clears throat> My message today is activating heaven. Activating heaven. I want heaven on my side working for me. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Pray my voice will be good and strong for tonight. We have to leave the worship at camp meeting and I'm going to need the strength of the Lord. And I believe that strength will be there when we need it. Amen. So if I don't raise my voice a whole lot this morning, then you'll know why. I'm just... I wanted to conserve a little bit. There was a, a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now, let's take a moment and just look at this man because he's in Caesarea, which if you look at Caesarea, you can see Caesar. It's like Caesarea. And Caesarea was a community in Israel that was named after Caesar. And it was not a center of Jewish influence, it wasn't a place that was built on the Bible, you could say. They had their taverns and they had their houses of ill repute and they had their places that were idolatrous in nature and many gods and goddesses, no doubt, in idol form would have been in Caesarea because of the fact that it was really there representing Rome rather than God's people. But in the midst of that place with its ungodliness was a man who knew how to pray. I don't care what your environment is. I don't care what your situation, what's coming against you spiritually. You can have a contact with God that will ride above all of your surroundings. There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. And there's no jail that is so strongly fortified that God can't meet with you if you call upon his name. And that's what Cornelius was doing. He was a man of prayer. The Bible says in verse 2 that he was a devout man. And that word devout meant, devout meant that he was very religious. He was dedicated. He was dedicated. He wasn't using God. He wasn't just, you know, entertaining God when he needed God and then doing his own thing. But he, this man was seriously committed. And today, if we want to get the attention of heaven... The very first thing that we need is a serious commitment. God is not interested in fair weather friendship. God is interested in committed people. That's why there will be few saved in that day when Jesus comes back. Because God is not looking for casual relationships. God today is looking for some seriously committed people. And you know, God will take you with all of your hangups and all of your all of your faults and failures and all of your uh, all of your liabilities if you are committed to him. When we say, God, I give you all of my heart, that doesn't mean I got it all together and then, God, I bring you my heart. That means I, I bring my heart with all my heart failure. I bring my I bring myself to you, God, with all everything I've got and everything I don't have. I bring it to you and I'm committed to you with all that I am. That's commitment. It doesn't mean that we get it all together and try to impress God. It just means that we're so impressed with God that we come as we are. And we come as we are today to worship God. We're not lifting our hands because we're worthy. We're lifting our hands in worship because He's worthy. I'm not praising God today because I'm so good. 
and I'm so wonderful. He's so good and he's so wonderful. And I'm praising him because of that. And I'm committed. I'm committed today to worship. And I'm committed to serving God. And Cornelius was committed. And of all the Gentiles that God could have reached out to in Caesarea and throughout Israel, because there were Gentiles that were there, there were many Roman soldiers, there were many people that were non-Jews that were there, but of all of those Gentiles or non-Jews that God would reach out, that who would become the first Christian, the first member of the church, God chose somebody right in the middle of Caesarea. Amen. And you may feel like you're in Caesarea today. That's all right. Because I want to tell you something. God can find you in your Caesarea. God can find you even though you may have been surrounded by everything that is ungodlike in your life. Uh, God, God, God comes today to, to seek and to save that which is lost. Amen. Amen. And God can find you. Amen. And God found this man. God found this man. The scripture says he respected God with all his house. He, he feared God. Now that word is an old English word to fear the Lord. And I know that there is a certain amount of, of fear in, in the fear of God that we do need to have. I fear stepping out of the plan of God. I do. I fear the consequences of going out and just deliberately doing something contrary to the word of God. I fear the consequences of what would happen if I rebelled against God. I don't fear God. I know he's uh, in the sense that I'm afraid of God, but I fear the consequences of a holy and a righteous God who does not tolerate foolishness. And Cornelius had that, had that fear of God. I have no idea where it came from. I have no idea because it's, it's probably uh, not uh, certain that his family would have been believers as far as his parents. You know, he grew up in the Roman culture. But somehow in the heart of Cornelius, there was an emptiness, and he began to search and to seek. And of course, being in Israel, he had uh, contact with the Word of God and with the message. And he may have known about Jesus. He may have heard about the crucifixion. No doubt he did from the Scripture. Uh, it, it, it's, it's apparent, really, that he heard about uh, Jesus and what happened to him at the crucifixion because you know it was a centurion that was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. I don't think it was probably Cornelius. But talk travels fast and there was a lot of strange things that was happening in Israel. For example, in this typical day of a typical crucifixion right at the, at the hour of noon all of a sudden the darkness rolled over and it was it was a foreboding darkness. It was it was a darkness that, uh, that expressed the the judgment of God and and and, and the darkness of sin. And it was it was a it was a it was a frightening darkness. And the, and the scripture lets us know that everybody was shaken, not only emotionally but they were physically shaken because the ground began to shake. There was a lot of things that happened that pointed to the fact that Jesus was no ordinary man dying on the cross. And even the centurion there when it was all done and Jesus lifted up his voice and said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. The Bible says when the ground began to shake and, and Jesus hung his head and died that that centurion said, truly this was the Son of God. He knew there was something special about Jesus. And you know, word travels fast. To thank God it does but when, something, when something so amazing happens as the crucifixion took place. And no doubt Cornelius had a friend that shared with him the events of what took place. And his heart was so affected by that. So he respected God. The Bible says he gave alms to the people. The alms were a way of giving to those that were poor, those that were in need. And I want you to notice the characteristics of this man because he got heaven's attention. First of all, he was devout. He was committed. If you want to get heaven's attention today, we cannot be wishy-washy in our faith. We cannot be wishy-washy in our dedication. We've got to be serious business with God. You've got to be serious with God. Some people say, well, I prayed and nothing happened. Did you get serious with God? Because if you get serious with God, God will get serious with you. The Bible says to the pure, he shows himself pure. 
to the froward, he shows himself froward. If we're hard to get along with, if, if God will be hard to get along with, amen. God will just reflect what we have. To the pure, he shows himself pure. To the froward, he shows himself. You think God's difficult? God can be very difficult. He can be. Amen. If you get difficult with God, God will be difficult with you. You don't expect God will hear and answer your prayers until you make some commitment to God. You say, I've tried before and I failed. Try again. That's what commitment is. It doesn't mean you don't fail. It means you just keep on trying. Because there will come a point where the devil will stop fighting you. He'll stop fighting me and he'll say, I might as well give up because they're not going to give up. And that's what God needs is some people that won't give up. Some people that are dedicated to getting God's attention. He was devout. He was committed. He respected God. And the thing is the culture in which he, his profession was a Roman soldier. He hung out with people that were rough. That did not respect, that took the name of God in vain. But he didn't. No, no. Cornelius respected God. He gave alms to the people. He helped those that were in need. I believe that there is more to church than just lifting our hands and praising God. Amen. Opening our hands to God. We've got to open our hands to people. Amen. I believe that God calls us to be a loving, giving, serving people. God cannot put something in your hand if you've got a closed fist. God can only put something in your hand if you've got an open hand. And I believe that when we honor God with our tithe and our offering, and this is coming from a pastor who forgets to take up the offering. How many know our church secretary, Pastor, you forgot to take up the offering tonight. That shows how little interest I have in money. But I'll tell you something, I love to give to God. Amen. And I believe that when you love God, that you give to God. Amen. I heard this story about this. This man, my daughter, was telling me that uh, this is a young couple in their area, they, they, they don't go to church, but he pays his tithes. He never misses paying his tithes to God's house, but he doesn't go to church. Now, that won't get him into heaven because you can't buy your way into heaven. But he honors God. And if we want to get God's attention today, we have to honor God with our time with our talent and with our treasures. And Cornelius did that. I'm just preaching to you the Bible. Again, I'm a pastor that forgets to take up the offering. <laughs> I've done it several times in the last little while. This COVID thing has really messed us up. Our, our protocol and our, our structure around here. But we remembered this morning. Amen. we got to pay that light bill. You know, the, the power companies always get their hand out. So does the phone company. So does the insurance company. So that the guy that comes in here and does the repairs, they've all got their hand open, out. Praise the Lord. Do you love your church? Yes. He gave alms to the people. He helped people. And the Bible says, and at last, lastly, it mentions, he prayed to God always. He was always praying, Brother Hannon. He was always praying. Always praying about something. You know, there's always something to pray about. So we should always be praying. Amen. You don't have to drop to your knees. You could be on the job site, Brother Ronnie, and you could talk, you can whisper a prayer and God will hear that prayer. Amen. You could be washing dishes, Mr. Bonnie. And then do you use paper plates if you wash dishes? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's uh, not get anybody mad here today. <laughs> Amen. You could be washing dishes at the kitchen sink and you could breathe a prayer. You could be driving down the road. The Bible says this man was always talking to God. And I believe a church that is always talking to God, there's a God who's always listening. Amen. And if we want to get God's attention, even though this was mentioned last, it's not the least. It's probably the most important of all of these characteristics. The Bible says that he prayed to God always. Huh. I want heaven's attention today. Now, the scripture tells us, as he was going through his routine, how many of you like routine? I like routine. I have, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of these ones that I, I uh, dawdle. <laughs> My wife will say, what's taking you so long? But I have to do all these things, and I've got to, there's a routine that I go through. Amen. This morning, I was trying to put my contact lenses in. I couldn't get my eyes open to do it. 
My routine took four times longer today. I finally, I prayed to God. I said, God, would you help me to get my eyes open so I can get that contact lens in? And he did. He helped me. <laughs> uh, this man made prayer routine. And the scripture says in verse 3, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and said unto him, Cornelius. Now you and I are not aware probably today of the angels of the Lord that are in this place, but the scripture tells us very clearly that heaven's angels are not just in heaven, but they are here on the earth. In fact, I wonder sometimes if they aren't more here than they are there. They report. But God has some invisible emissaries. He has some representatives who he sends to help us. They work in the invisible spirit world. They were in their, this service when we were worshiping, and they're in this service right now. And some of you have actually seen the angel of the Lord. Well, I've been ministering the word of God. Because I've had people tell me, and I don't think they talk amongst themselves, but have seen in the spirit realm and have seen the angels of the Lord. I'll tell you, I can't preach without the help of God's army. Because all hell would have, like to shut me down today. This message of hope, this message of love. This message of peace that I'm sending forth today. The enemy, you think the devil fights you? You have no idea what fight is. I could spell fight better than anybody here. Because if there's anybody that Satan fights, it's the ministry. That's why we have this little box here. It's sitting under the pulpit right now. And uh, whoever's got that this week can, can come and get that and take that prayer shawl. That's why we have somebody every week praying for a pastor and pastor's work wife and family, half hour a day for God's uh, power, provision, and protection. I mean, I would never pastor a church that didn't really pray for their pastor. I mean, because all hell is against ministry. Satan hates the church because of what we are doing. It, it defies what he's trying to do. But we've got the upper hand. Amen. We've got the power of the Lord. Amen. And a church that knows how to pray, let me tell you something, there's an army of heaven that are backing us up. You know something? For every angel that fell from heaven in the great rebellion with Satan himself and turned their back on God, two-thirds of the angels remained faithful. And the scripture tells us there is an innumerable company of angels. You couldn't count them if you tried. There are so many, many millions and millions and millions, obviously billions and billions, of angels of the Lord. And God does not allow us to see them. Usually. But this particular man. While he was praying. God broke through the spirit world. Into the physical realm. And that angel appeared before him. With a message. With some direction. Now he did not provide. The answer. That Cornelius was looking for. But he directed him. In the way that he could find the answer. And the angel came to him and he spoke his name, Cornelius. And I want to tell you something. The angels of the Lord know who you are. They know you by name. And if you are serving God, if you are committed to the Lord, if you fear and respect the Lord, if you are praying always, if you're giving alms to the people, if you are devout and dedicated to God, you've got at least one angel that is following you around. He's protecting you when you climb up on the staging. He's protecting you while you're working with the, with the electrical wires. He's protecting you when you go out on the highway. The angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him and he delivers them. I have only had a few angelic experiences that I am aware of in my life and in my ministry. But they have been confirmed by other people as well. And I know with all my heart that what God has said in his word is true. 
that the angels of the Lord go before us and behind us and they protect us and God uses them to minister in our lives. Oh, so well, why doesn't God do things directly? Well, I have a question for you. Why doesn't God just preach the gospel to the whole world? No, he works through instrumentality of the human people. God works through the body of Christ. We are the human representation of Jesus to the world. And God has a plan and God works through his plan. And we are the body of Christ on this earth. We preach the gospel. And uh, typically you don't see angels preaching the gospel. Now, Cornelius needed to be saved, but the angel never told him how. But he connected him with a man that would, Simon Peter. There are certain things we see that angels do, and there are certain things that we see that angels don't do. But one thing we know is just as we have our part in God's plan, God has angels as well that work. And I want to tell you something today, that heaven is working with this church. Heaven has her eyes upon this church. The angels of the Lord are working in St. George. And God knows every hungry soul out there. God knows every hurting person. God knows every lost and lonely person that needs to know Jesus. And we may not know where they are, but God has his eye upon them. And God can speak their name and God can cause us to connect. And one of the things I see that angels do in the scriptures is they connect people with other people. And the angel frightened him when he when Cornelius first saw him in verse 4 when he looked at him he was afraid and he said what is it Lord and he said unto him thy prayers and thine alms thy prayers and thy giving to the poor are come up for a memorial before God you've got you've got God's attention God can't forget you there's a memorial that has been built by your prayers it's like every time you pray that memorial gets higher and higher and higher and you finally got all of heaven's attention Cornelius I believe that every angel in glory their eyes were fixed on Cornelius that day because they knew that Cornelius was the first Gentile to surrender his heart and his life to the Lord Jesus Christ he was to be the first Christian born again into the church of the living God and that was a very significant moment and you know something, when you give your heart and your life to God, you have no idea the domino effect that will take place. When you give your heart to God and you really live for God with everything, you can swing wide open a door that thousands and millions of people can come through. And that's what happened that day to Cornelius. When that angel came through and gave him that message, he said, you send men to Joppa, verse 5. And call for one, Simon, whose surname is Peter. His real name is Simon, but they nicknamed him Peter, which meant the rock. He lodges with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. The angel knew Simon Peter by name. He knew where he was. He knew the guy that he was living with. He knew it was by the seaside. And he knew that he would have the message that would help Cornelius with his dilemma. And when the angel which spake on Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Now on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, while they were heading towards Joppa to connect with Peter, God was working in Peter's heart at the same time. Isn't it amazing how when heaven is working in your heart, God can be another place miles away dealing with the heart of somebody else and preparing them for what's to happen in your life. I want to tell you something. God is not scatterbrained. He's got a plan in place that is so amazing that we really only just to stumble upon it and discover it. But the plan of God was already 
set in motion before we ever stepped into it. Now, I don't believe that God predestines everything that happens. I believe that God doesn't predestine whether you respond this morning to God because you've got that power. You've got more power than God does to choose your eternity. As much as God loves you, as much as he died on the cross, Jesus died on the cross for your soul to be saved, you've got more power in that decision that you make. That's quite a thing, isn't it? That God would limit himself and allow you and I the freedom of choice. But there are certain things that God is not going to step out of the way and say, well, you know, I abdicate being God. No, God is God. And God could control every single thing in this world if he so desired because he is sovereign. But there are times when God actively steps away from his sovereignty so that he might display other attributes. And God had a purpose, God had a reason for allowing you and I the ability to freely choose. Because God would rather work with people that cooperate willingly with him than he would with somebody that comes, he, drag, they're being drugged right. along the way. I'm glad I've made up my mind, I'm going to cooperate with God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to work with heaven because if I want heaven to work with me, I've got to work with heaven. Now work with me, amen. Amen. How many know that there will never be a church that will be in revival where the church doesn't work with the pastor? It'll never happen. We've got to work together with the Holy Ghost. Amen. You say God is dependent on us. Yes, and we're dependent on God. It's a two-way street. We're workers together with God. We cooperate with heaven and heaven cooperates with us. If you want heaven to cooperate with you, then you've got to cooperate with heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are cooperating. We're yielding. But the scripture tells us, on the morrow as they went their way, drew nigh in the city, Peter was up on the household, house top to pray about the sixth hour. Can I stop right there and just tell you this, that God has a real hard time directing a parked car. If you've got your car in park and you're not going anywhere, God has a real hard time directing you. But if you'll pull it out of park and down into, into D for drag. <laughs> My dad was <laughs> teaching drivers that years ago and there was a, one of the girls was really nervous, a 16 year old. And the boys were in the, sitting in the back seat. She's behind the wheel and they were just trying everything they could to confuse her. They say things like, put in an R for race. Put it in D for drag. <laughs> it was my dad trying to teach her and keep her, on the, keep her from being confused and they were everything. Amen. But how many know that if a church wants to go somewhere, we've got to put it in D for drive. God can steer us when we have an obedience mindset. We've got to be willing to obey the Lord. And Peter was praying. He was already in motion. He was headed up to that housetop to pray about the sixth hour. He became very hungry. He would have eaten. <laughs> but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So he's up at the rooftop and he's so hungry. I can only imagine how hungry he was. He fell into a trance. He just sort of like, <clears throat> the eyes were open, but he was in another world. And there is another world all around us right now. Technologically right now, there's another world all around us. This, these this atmosphere is bombarded right now with waves. Those waves are going right through your body. I was going to say not causing any damage, not cutting you up. Hopefully they're not. But they are. There's waves. There's electromagnetic energy that is flooding this place. We are bombarded. Ever turn on your uh, your laptop in a strange place and, and you, you've got the uh, password and, and the username and you're about to connect and you see like, oh, where is it? Because there's a list as long as your arm of all of the Wi-Fi, especially if you live in an apartment building or even in a neighborhood. I can see all our neighbor's Wi-Fi. I can't get into it because I don't have the password, but it's all around. We're being bombarded, amen, by energy that is in this place that's totally invisible. You don't feel it, you don't see it, you don't hear it, but it's here. And so it is in the spirit realm. You don't see it, you don't typically hear it with your auditory senses. You don't 
maybe even feel it, but yet it is moving through this place. And if your eyes were opened so that you could see into the technological room that is here, that is just as real as the physical room, you would be amazed at what is just, it's just busy, 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 going all the time. In fact, right now we are broadcasting from this little uh, unit here, this iPad is sending out a signal to our router and then through the phone lines and it's potentially going around the world. While we're here thinking about a million other things, that is happening. It is a miraculous concept. But even more miraculous is the concept of God's presence. And the spiritual reality that you may not taste or touch or feel or hear or see, but it is taking place in this room because we are more than physical bodies here. We are spiritual beings that are in touch with a spiritual world. And while we pray and while we worship and while we obey the Lord and serve the Lord, we are, we are ourselves radiating spiritual energy. You are just like a, a little beacon that is beeping out a signal to heaven. And heaven is responding. While you're not even aware of it, heaven is responding to your hunger for God. And so here is Peter, and he is on the rooftop, and he is praying, and he's talking to God. And when he falls into this trance, and he sees into the spiritual realm that up to this point was invisible, he saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, picture a bed sheet, uh, a bed sheet, and it's knit together at the four corners. So the four corners of that sheet are pulled together, and it's kind of like a great big sack. <laughs> and it's, be, it's descending from heaven, and as it comes down, then, then it's opened up, uh, and he sees that there are all kinds of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, like wild animals, and creeping things, uh, and fowls of the air. This is really a strange thing for Peter, you know, he's up there praying, and he's in this vision, and he sees all of this, and he's, you know, a great big question mark in his mind about the spiritual realm, and that's usually how it affects us. Is we question, I, I don't understand what's happening. And it happened three times that he saw this, this happen, and, and the voice came to him. He said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Now he's hungry. But the problem is that uh, most of the beasts that he sees here are unclean beasts. There are are animals that God has forbid his people in the Old Testament to eat. They could eat the deer because the, the deer had a cloven hoof and and, the two, and, and, uh, and uh, the, the sheep, they could have sheep. But there were certain animals that they couldn't have because they were considered unclean. And it was just to illustrate to God, uh, to the people that God wanted his people to be separated. Certain animals are clean, partake. Certain animals are unclean, stay away from them. Uh, because you are to be a holy and a clean people and God wanted them to be separate. But now God is telling them to do something different that he's never ever uh, considered doing. God says, arise, uh, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, no, Lord, I, this is obviously God is just tempting me. God is asking me to do something that is wrong just to see if my heart is right. He says, no, God, I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And God spoke to him three times. And he began to question, well, why would God tell me to do something that I, I feel within myself is wrong? It's, it's contradicting me. And finally, it was all done. And the sheet was gathered together by the four corners. And all those animals went back up in, into glory. And the Bible says in verse 17 that Peter, just like you and I, he doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean. He began to doubt. First it was questions and now it's doubt. I don't understand. God is asking me to do something that I don't feel right about. How do you respond when God contradicts you? You know, the real nature of a person can be told not when people agree with them, but when they're contradicted. And when the word of God, when God sends a message to you and I that contradicts what we've always believed and what we always thought, do we stick with what we have always believed and thought or do we go with what God is saying? 
See, God had a plan all along that it was not just the separated Jewish nation that was going to be saved and be the people of God. God was going to swing wide open the doors to all of the Gentile nations which were unclean. God was going to bring them in and cleanse them and save them. And they were all going to be part of one body, one church, where there was neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, bond nor free. But we'd all be one in Jesus Christ. This was the plan of God. But Peter wasn't ready for the plan of God. And that has forever been the problem with the church today, is that God gets ready to do some things, and we're not quite ready. We don't understand it. We, and that's, that's a fact. We don't really understand the ways of God. His thoughts are above our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. And one thing we need to do in the church as we pray and as we seek God for His will is be willing for God to wipe the slate clean and rewrite on our minds and our hearts what His plan is. Because many times our plan and God's plans are two different things. We need to go with God's plan. We need to cooperate with heaven. God gave them the answer that he needed because as soon as the vision was finished and Peter came back to his normal senses and uh, the Bible says there's three men that are waiting for you at the door. You better go down and talk to them. And when he gets down to the door, here we see this connection. God is connecting Peter with Cornelius now through his servants and soldiers. He's connecting them, but we see some things begin to take place that are the fulfillment of the plan of God. And so <laughs> there he does. So he obeys the Lord while Peter thought in the vision, verse 19, the spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek. Oh, there's that magical. <laughs> there's that number three. Three times he saw the vision. Three times God spoke to him. And now there's three men. So it's beginning to make sense. But if you stayed on the rooftop and kept praying, like some of the church, don't realize that prayer is just a means for us to get our marching orders and then to do the will of God. We don't just pray, but we pray and we obey. There's action that we need to add to our, our prayer. There's works that we need to add to our faith. And if we want to really get heaven cooperating with us and doing the miraculous in our midst, then we need to add some obedience to our prayers. We need to go with the direction of the Holy Ghost. Don't be afraid to obey God. Be afraid not to obey God. Let your fear of disobedience help you overcome your fear of obedience. I don't want, I, I, I fear disobeying God because I don't want to miss out on what God has for me. I don't want to be kicking myself all around Cornerstone saying, well, look what I missed because I didn't move when God told me to move. Peter went down off the rooftop, but he's still praying in his heart and he meets these men. And when he meets this man, he gets some of his questions answered. You see, some of your questions are not answered in prayer. They're answered in obedience. He said, well, when I understand it all, then I will, I'll go with it. But if the word of God has come to you, obey God and then you'll understand it. It's like trying to teach math to, a, to an ant. <laughs> Some things you're not going to understand. You don't have the ability to understand it until you experience it. When you experience it, when you obey God, when I obey God, the things start to come together. It makes sense. Let me tell you something. You don't have to have all the answers in order to obey God. You just have to have God on your side and heaven working for you. And I, ha I have found so many times things have just fallen together. It's fallen in place when I thought it might fall apart because my heart was right with God and I was endeavoring to do God's will. Amen. In my imperfect manner, because I don't care how hard we try, our obedience is still imperfect in, pla in its place. Uh, but God honors it. And heaven works with us. Hallelujah. And I found that most of the time God asks us to do really simple things. Things that we can actually do. Things that will help further God's plan. So they come down, they begin to chat. They say, well, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one that fears God of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into thy house and to hear the words of thee. And then called he them in, Peter asked them to come in, and he lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him the next day. 
And on the morrow after, so it took a few days to get back there, they, as they entered into Caesarea, Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Now, let me tell you something. It's not just angels that connect people, but people connect people as well. Because God's not going to send an angel to witness for you when you've got a mouth and you've got a heart and you've got a testimony and you've got a love for God and love for people. You and I, we can't expect the angels to testify for us. Cornelius said, oh, I was praying the other day and God sent an angel and told me that Peter's going to come and preach and you've got to come, you just got to come and you've got to be here for this meeting. you just got to be here. He just urged that he got his entire family together. Talk about connections. His near, his kinsmen, that would be his relatives, his near friends. It wasn't just his family, but he also reached out to his friends. Amen. How many know that God, it's the will of God for us to reach out to our friends and our relatives? You know why? Because they trust you. They know you. If you say that God has done something in your life, if you tell them you've had a spiritual experience with God, they've got no reason to doubt you because they know you. And they trust you. Now, they may not be willing to make a commitment. That's all right. You share it anyway. We need to stop feeling responsible for the salvation of other people when it's only God that can save them. But in the same token, we need to realize that God's not going to be responsible for being the witness. That's your responsibility. And my responsibility is to tell them what God has done for us. Amen. And to at least invite them and give them an opportunity. And you know what? He was shocked. When the place was filled, there was no room but standing room only probably in Cornelius' household because people knew that when Cornelius said something, it was the truth. And if you've got a problem telling the truth and then you tell somebody that God's done something for you, they're going to think that's just another lie. Because if you go around lying all the time and you're not honest, then people, but if you would speak the truth and you tell people that God has done something in your life, they're going to believe you. And you're not responsible for their response. You're only responsible for your obedience to the Lord. But Peter comes in and Cornelius met him and he just, his respect for God was so great that he fell down at Peter's feet and worshiped him. Now, that was not the right thing to do. This Roman had grown up around all kinds of idolatry and God did not want Peter worship and God doesn't want your pastor worship and I don't ever want people to put me on a pedestal I don't want to be in a place where I can fall I just want to be loved and you know respected in the correct way of course because we should all respect one another that's that's only right but uh, but he fell before Peter and began to worship it so great was his respect and I think there's something to be said for respect if we want God's angels to be working in our midst respect must be there can you say amen I have noticed in the revival churches that I've been a part of, and I've been a part of probably three in my entire life, three or four, maybe a few more, but only about three or four come to my mind. I've been in a lot of good churches, but not every good church has revival. But every revival church was a place where people respected the word of God. I've noticed that. And they respected the man of God and they respected the presence of God. Because God doesn't waste his time pouring out revival in an atmosphere where that isn't in place. Those have been my observations and the word to the wise is sufficient. But Cornelius, he fell in worship. Peter took him by the hand and said, stand up. I myself also am a man. I'm just a man. And he talked with him and he went in and he found that what he thought was going to be one man and maybe his immediate family was a whole community of people that were waiting there to hear the word of God. And Peter begins to preach the wonderful message, the same message that he preached in Acts chapter two to the Jews. He preaches here to the Gentiles and lo and behold, before he even gets to his altar call or to its conclusion of his message, God interrupts and God pours out his spirit and this entire household of people that are so hungry for the word of God begin to speak in other tongues. Just instantly, they just begin to speak in tongues and they are being filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, that's what God would love to do in this place. 
that people just under the, during the preaching of the word are just filled with the Holy Ghost. That God, I wish to God that, that the Holy Ghost would interrupt me more often when I'm preaching. I would, I would just say that would be a, the most wonderful thing if I couldn't get to finish my message because the power of God began to fall upon our people and our visitors that are gathered out in, on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night that God would just interrupt us once in a while. Amen. Amen. I wish he didn't interrupt us every service that the Holy Ghost would come. That's what happened. And Peter's like, uh, Lord, I'm not finished my notes yet. <laughs> I don't hardly think that Peter had notes, actually. He didn't have an iPad. He didn't even have a piece of paper. He just preached out of his heart what God gave him. And God filled this entire... Man, it wasn't just his family. It was his relatives. It was neighbors. It was... Can you imagine how Caesarea was impacted? Because one man cooperated with heaven. And heaven cooperated. That's just one man. In Caesarea, what would happen if I don't know how many adults we have in this place? We've got teachers out there teaching Sunday school and children. But if every single one of us got a hold of God today, if God could do that through one man, what would happen when the church unifies together? I'm telling you, folks, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into our hearts the things that God has prepared for Cornerstone Tabernacle. And every other church that will pray and seek God and cooperate with heaven. I want to tell you something. We just need to be open. Peter had to be open. It took a little bit of a tweaking for his thinking to come into line with God's thinking. See, God's thinking was so great, much greater than Peter's thinking. And our problem is never a shortage of power or a shortage of, the, of God's willingness. It's usually always on our, our, our thinking. It's on this end, it's our minds are small and we can't, we can't conceive of God. And we need to just open up our minds to the word of God and what God can do in our midst. Say, so God, you know what? I don't care if you interrupt my schedule, my plan. I don't care, just mess it all up, God. Just show up and do what you do, Lord. Can we stand together? Would you pray with me today? For our district, there is a powerful move of God that is coming. I believe God wanted us there for camp meeting to be able to witness and see what God is doing. Would you pray that the Holy Ghost would be poured out in this service tonight? I know there's a lot of tired people going to probably be there. It's been, you know, several nights. So we're not used to night after night and day services. It's tiring, but it's a beautiful way to get worn out. Would you pray that God, I believe that here at Cornerstone, that we can pray. Yeah. I know God woke me up several mornings. I believe he did. He didn't let me get back to sleep, though I wanted to. I really did. But I needed, I was thankful that God has confidence in me and my prayers. I'm glad that my prayers can touch heaven. Yes. And I want to, would you lift your hand? I don't care what you're going through right now. Would you lift your hands to heaven? I don't care where you are spiritually right now. And close your eyes. And I want you to pray a prayer. I want you to pray a prayer just for others today. It's not just for you, but it's for, it's for the church. We're going to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. We lift up our camp meeting. We lift up brother and sister Brent and Daphne Carter, Lord, our spiritual leaders, oh God, in this district. We lift up, oh God, every person that is taking part in the service. We lift up every participant, oh God, every person, oh Lord, that would be in that tabernacle. We pray for a great outpouring of supernatural power. We pray for the glory of God to show up. We pray, Lord, to, tonight, oh God, in this afternoon, for heaven to kiss earth. We pray, oh God, we want to work with you. We want the outpouring. You promised it, oh God. And God, we know that there are things coming, oh Lord. They're already happening, Lord, even this very week. Your spirit has been moving, touching hearts and lives and changing people. And things are happening. Prayers are being answered and prodigals are coming back to Jesus. And God, we pray today. Lord, that conviction will be so strong that people will not be able to shake it up. We pray that the glory and the power of God 
would be so strong in our midst, oh God, that people, Lord, will be overwhelmed. That every person in the tabernacle will be filled with the Spirit of God. That, God, we will see things happen, Lord, that we have never seen happen before, God. Because we are in the last days and your return is so soon. And we don't have time to waste, oh God. We better start cooperating with heaven right now, oh God. And I believe, Lord, that it's not a question of whether heaven will cooperate for us. Heaven is waiting to cooperate with us. And oh God, we just say, God, today we surrender to your will and to your plan. And God, we're thankful, oh God, that, that we have got your attention, that you have seen the prayers and the tears that have been shed and the groanings from our heart, oh God, as we desperately desire, oh God, to be in that place with you, oh God, where you could work through us. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise, and we thank you, God, for what you're do doing and going to do, oh Lord, even when we don't see it, you're working, oh God. And we give you glory and we give you honor and we give you praise. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today.